So let me say, first of all, how grateful I am to Jane Crotelli for inviting me to speak here and to all of you for coming to hear me. Um, I've heard great things about this parish from my friend Leia and from others. I've uh, met many members of the parish. I'm really happy to be here uh, as part of this pop-up theology series. Now, at least since Elizabeth Cady Stanton published the Women's Bible in the 1890s, there have been attempts by feminists and others to show that there are other possible readings of the Garden of Eden story that don't represent patriarchy as divinely ordained. So for a long time, patriarchy was considered to be kind of the, the message of the So according to some feminist biblical scholars, such as Phyllis Tribble, the Garden of Eden represents the ideal state in which women and men are equal partners, whereas patriarchy is one of the tragic results of the first sin. So Pope John Paul II offered a similar, but not exactly, feminist reading of the Garden of Eden in a series of lectures that were published in 1981 under the title The Original Unity of Man and Woman. These lectures were foundational for what became known as his Theology of the Body, which has been incorporated into the Catholic Church's marriage preparation curriculum. The good news is that a reading of the Adam and Eve story that regards patriarchy as sinful and contrary to divine intent has become widely accepted in Roman Catholic teaching, even though John Paul II did not use the term patriarchy and distanced his reading from feminism. The bad news, though, is that heteronormativity is at the heart of his anti-patriarchal reinterpretation of the story of Adam and Eve. Moreover, the theology of the body puts an inordinate emphasis on Genesis 2-3 as the biblical teaching on the body, sexuality, and marriage. In recent decades, the story of Adam and Eve has more often been deployed as a weapon against LGBTQ people than against women. So how many of you have heard Adam and Eve cited in a homophobic argument? Adam Pretty often, right? <laughs> um, so one of the things I want to look at this evening is what Genesis 2 does and doesn't say about human relationships. But primarily, I want to look at some other passages or stories in the Old Testament that may be read as counter traditions to Genesis 2. I'm borrowing the term counter-traditions from one of my favorite, favorite feminist biblical scholars, Ilana Pardes, whose first book, published in 1992, was called Counter-Traditions in the Bible, a Feminist Approach. She uses the term counter-traditions to mean stories that challenge patriarchy. But I'm appropriating it here to mean stories that challenge heteronormativity, the idea that men and women were meant to be, you know, paired exclusively in marriage. Specifically, I will use it for stories that can be read as challenging the heteronormative claims of Genesis 2. My claim is that the Old Testament is not uniformly heteronormative, and that we should all, straight people as well as LGBTQ people, be prepared to argue with people who claim, without qualification, that the Bible condemns homosexuality. Yes, there are a few verses that these people love to use as clubs, but the Bible as a whole presents a broad spectrum of human relationships. And I want to share a couple of examples from the Old Testament with you this evening. So first of all, Genesis 2. How heteronormative is it? In looking at Genesis 2, it's important to note, first of all, that the human being created out of the ground in Genesis 2-7, so that's the passage on the right, was neither male nor female, or rather, it was both. The word that's translated the man in Genesis 2-7, Hadam, is the same word that is translated mankind, or human beings, in the passage on the left, which is Genesis 1.27, where it says male and female, he created them. It's only in anticipation of the subsequent creation of woman in Genesis 2 that this translation, the New American Bible Revised Edition, translates Adam as the man, rather than mankind, or the human being. So in Genesis 2, the two-step creation of the first of humankind, Adam, oh sorry, first of humankind, and then of man and woman, Ish and Isha, is for the purpose of making a point that human beings are not meant to be alone. A few points against a heteronormative. Um, so just as the term that's translated uh, the man in Genesis 2:18, it is not good for the man to be alone. It's not actually the man; it's the human being. Uh, neither is the term a helper suited to him. Um, that phrase does have a masculine um, pronoun in the, to him, but in Hebrew there are no neuter pronouns, so you have to use one or the other, and the masculine is the sort of default pronoun there. So um, it's often used in a, in a gender inclusive way, as in Genesis 1.27, which says, in the image of God who created him, male and female who created them. 
Second, Genesis 2 may be teaching that humans have more in common with other animals than we like to think, since God's initial solution to the problem, that it's not good for the man or for the human to be alone, is to create other animals. If procreation were the primary purpose of this helper, then surely God would have started with the helper of the same species. Rather, the primary purpose of the helper seems to be companionship. Uh, so here's where it gets heteronormative. In the first couple of verses, the man uh, still translates Ha'adam, um, the human. From the narrator's perspective, the woman, Ha'isha, is created out of the rib of the human, which gives rise to my preferred interpretation that what's happening here is not the creation of a new being, like the creation of uh, animals out of the ground, but the separation of the female part of the human being from the male. In verse 23, however, where it says, the man says, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Here we get the man's perspective. In recognizing and naming what has been taken from his flesh and bones as woman, Isha, he also names himself for the first time using the gendered term Ish, man. It is possible to interpret this verse as meaning that the gender binary is a human construct invented by first human, since it is first articulated in the man's speech. But our heteronormative interpretation is unfortunately supported by the next verse. That is why a man, Ish, leaves his father and mother, and clings to his wife, Ishto, which literally means his woman, and the two of them become one body, or more literally one flesh. The only way around a heteronormative reading of this verse that I can think of is actually changing the wording, which breaks all the rules of biblical exegesis. But just for the sake of argument, for a second, if we were to substitute the terms from the previous verse for a man and his woman in verse 24, we would get, therefore, a human being, Adam, leaves his father and mother, or leaves their father and mother, and clings to a helper suited to them, Ezra Kedeng Do, and the two of them become one flesh. But the biblical scholar in me rebels against changing the words of the biblical text to make it say what we want it to say. So, <laughs> I think it's time to look at some other Old Testament stories to find some alternative models of human relationships in the Bible. So, first one, Ruth and Naomi. Naomi and her husband and two sons, who were from Bethlehem in Judah, migrated to the land of Moab uh, because there was a famine in Judah. The two sons married Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah, but first Naomi's husband and then both of her sons died, leaving the three women as widows. Naomi urged Ruth and Orpah to return to their families of origin because she was going to return to her homeland. After a good deal of persuasion, Orpah turns back from following Naomi, but Ruth clings to her. This is a dramatic moment captured here in a drawing by William Blake in 1795. What makes it significant for us is that the same verb, devak, is used here for clings to, as we find in Genesis 2.24, therefore a man leaves father and mother and clings to his wife. The use of this same verb, which is not an all that common verb in Hebrew, for Ruth clinging to Naomi, shows that it refers to an emotional attachment. Later on, Naomi's relative Boaz commends Ruth for having left father and mother to come to a people she did not know before. So we have both elements of leaving father and mother and the clinging to Naomi. Ruth's words to Naomi are such a powerful profession of love that they are sometimes read at weddings. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there be buried. May the Lord do thus to me and more, if even death separates me from you. The formula, may the Lord do thus to me and more, means that the speech is formally a vow. Ruth is vowing her fidelity to Naomi, no matter what happens. Sadly for Ruth, Naomi at this point in the story does not seem to return Ruth's love. But by the beginning of chapter 3, when the two women have been living together for a while in Bethlehem, Naomi addresses Ruth as my daughter, which doesn't necessarily mean my daughter, and announces her intention to provide for Ruth's future by seeking a pleasing home for her. Naomi's plan involves Ruth taking a tremendous risk by going to Boaz alone in the middle of the night and offering herself sexually to him, but, fortunately, Boaz behaves honorably. When he discovers that it's Ruth who's lying beside him, he exclaims, May the Lord bless you, my daughter. Again, my daughter's not. Don't think incest. 
You have been even more loyal now than before in not going after the young men, whether poor or rich. Now rest assured, my daughter, I will do for you whatever you say. All the townspeople know you to be a worthy woman. So, he marries. Now, is this a happy ending for Ruth? Boaz took Ruth, meaning married her. When they came together as husband and wife, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord, who has not failed to provide you today with the Redeemer. May he become famous in Israel. He will restore your life and be the support of your old age. For his mother, who is the daughter-in-law, sorry, his mother is the daughter-in-law who loves you. She is worth more to you than seven sons. Naomi took the boy, cradled him against her breast, and cared for him. And the neighbor women joined the celebration. A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. <coughs> So I used to resent the fact that the women of Jerusalem seemed to appropriate the Moabite Ruth's son for Naomi. But in counter traditions in the Bible, Ilana Cardes points out that the Hebrew idiom, a son has been born to X, in that idiom, the X is always the father's name, not the mother's. And moreover, the women of Bethlehem who named the child emphasized to Naomi that his mother is your daughter-in-law who loves you. So the women of Bethlehem seem to be claiming the child for Ruth and Naomi. And it's Boaz who's getting left out. Now, I don't think we need to worry about Boaz being reduced to a sperm donor because the patriarchal society would have taken good care of him. But it's interesting to hear the women of Bethlehem's perspective on this family. And that the bond between Ruth and Naomi, it is a bond between Ruth and Naomi that gets remarked upon. The statement, she is worth more to you than seven sons, may be an allusion to a verse in 1 Samuel 1, which comes immediately after Ruth in the Christian Bible. So it's like literally the next chapter after this chapter of Ruth. That chapter tells the story of Hannah, who is initially depressed because she has been unable to conceive. Her husband, Elkanah, who loves her, tries to comfort her, saying, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why are you not eating? Why are you so miserable? Am I not better for you than ten sons? Whereas in 1 Samuel 1, it's the love between a husband and wife that's supposed to compensate for the lack of children. Here, it is Ruth's love that is supposed to compensate Naomi for the loss of her husband and sons. But Naomi also gets a new son into the bargain, Obed who was none other than the grandfather of King David. I could say more about the fact that the Bible traces the ancestry of Israel's most famous king to this very unconventional family, but instead I want to move on to one of the love relationships of David himself. David is probably best known as the poet of many of the Psalms, or for killing Goliath when he was a youth, or perhaps for his military conquests as king of Israel, including the city of Jerusalem, which before David's reign was a Canaanite city. When people think of David's erotic relationships, they tend to think first of his sordid affair with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. But David had another erotic attachment before he became king that tends not to be talked about as much because it was with another young man, Jonathan, the son of Saul, who was the first king of Israel whom David eventually displaced. This painting by Giovanni Battista Cima from around 1505 is one of the few depictions of this couple, Jonathan and David, in Western art. As the painting suggests, Jonathan's love for David began at the time when David slew the light. Let's see the head. The first mention of their love comes at the beginning of 1 Samuel 18, immediately after the chapter in which David kills Goliath and is reintroduced to Saul as the brave boy who dared to take on the Philistine champion with only a slingshot. Apparently, Jonathan was present during this introduction because we read that by the time Saul was finished talking to David, Jonathan loved David, quote, as his very self. Now, this relationship is often characterized as friendship or maybe what we might today call a bromance. <laughs> but I will present you with a preponderance of evidence that it was more than that. First, recall that at this point in the narrative, David is only a lowly shepherd boy, while Jonathan is the king's son and heir apparent. Yet, quote, Jonathan and David made a covenant because, um, sorry, because Jonathan loved him as his very self. Jonathan took off the cloak he was wearing and handed it over to David, along with his military dress, even his sword, bow, and belt. Jonathan's willingness to give up the power differential that separates him from David is a clear sign that the co covenant they enter into is not about securing a political alliance, as some, as some have suggested. Rather, by taking off his military garb and weapons and handing them to David, 
Jonathan shows that he cares more about David's love than about his position as next in line to the throne. But does David return Jonathan's love? That's not yet clear. Saul, on the other hand, is thinking about David from a political standpoint. And as soon as he sees David's growing popularity, he tries to secure his allegiance by offering David first his elder daughter, Merob, and then his younger daughter, Michal, in marriage. David demurs both times on the grounds that he's unworthy to marry the king's daughter, even though he's already entered into a covenant with the king's son. <laughs> Saul, feeling more and more threatened by David, turns the offer into a challenge. Bring me the foreskins of a hundred Philistines, and I'll let you marry Michal. David falls for it, but he doesn't get killed by the Philistines, as Saul had hoped. Instead, he goes out and kills 200 Philistines and brings their foreskins to Saul. One wonders who he was really trying to impress. But David, claim, uh, David claims Michal as his prize, and as soon as they are married, Saul realizes that he still, he still doesn't control David, and he's even more afraid. In the next chapter, both Jonathan and Michal intervene to protect David from Saul's murderous intentions. By chapter 20, it's clear that Jonathan is willing to betray his own father for the sake of David. When Saul figures out that Jonathan and David have been plotting behind his back, the way he rebukes Jonathan shows that he's probably aware of the erotic nature of their relationship. So Saul says to his son, I mean, yeah, Saul says to his son, son of a rebellious woman, do I not know that to your own disgrace and to the disgrace of your mother's nakedness, you are the companion of Jesse's son? The sexually charged language implies that Jonathan has disgraced himself sexually as well as putting his own political future at risk. Jonathan persists in taking David's side against his father, but he also knows that for his own safety and David's, they must not be seen together anymore. There are two accounts of David's final meeting with Jonathan. The first, which follows immediately upon Jonathan's quarrel with his father, is the more emotional of the two. The two men kiss, and both men weep aloud. Then they reaffirm the covenant that they've made with one another. That's the one on the left. The second version on the right seems more political, but it also envisions an ongoing relationship between David and Jonathan. Jonathan assures David that he will be king of Israel, and Jonathan will be second to him. Here Jonathan is undeniably placing his relationship with David above that of his father Saul. The final word on the love affair of David and Jonathan is David's lament when Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle with the Philistines several years later. In the interim, Saul has made several attempts on David's life and has given his daughter Michal to another man in marriage since David abandoned her when he fled Saul. David has also acquired another wife in the meantime, Abigail, but he has not gotten over his love for Jonathan, which we finally get to hear about in his words. David's passion for Jonathan comes through in the final lines of this psalm. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. Again, not brother. Most dear have you been to me. More wondrous your love to me than the love of women. How the warriors have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. It seems to me that the burden of proof is on those who claim that David and Jonathan are just good friends to explain how more wondrous your love to me than the love of women is not homoerotic. The relationship of David and Jonathan seems to me to be a clear challenge to the heteronormative interpretation of Genesis 2 and that Jonathan leaves behind his father, and presumably his mother, although she's not mentioned, for the sake of his love for David. And David explicitly prefers Jonathan's love to the love of women. So, the story of David and Jonathan, like that of Ruth and Naomi, illustrates that the Bible does not just endorse one model of human relationship, heterosexual marriage. So now I'd be happy to answer questions about what I said, or any question at all relating to the Bible and sexuality. <coughs> So my friends, the floor is open if you have a question. I already see your, you're ready, Luda? I already asked the question, that's oh. all right. Well, you can ask But we all want to hear Yeah, we all want to now, yeah, I said, like, uh, is it really meaning, like, is this story is actually true about Adam and Eve? It's actually it's, a man. It's a myth, which means it's a truth-bearing story. Yeah, right? but... There's truth in it, but it's not literally, like, historically true. But it's supposed to tell us something. Keep using the mic. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? 
examples throughout the Bible? These are the clearest examples of specifically same-sex relationships. So I had one other example when I gave a little longer version of this talk, but it's not a story. It's, it's a, like a little wisdom saying, which I think means that um, it, it offers an alternative model of what it means for the human not to be alone. But that's a little bit too complicated to go into because it's, it's a difficult text. How about in the New Testament? Because I can yeah. I can imagine some Christians saying, "Well, that's Old Testament, so mm -hmm. you know, you know, like yeah. dismissing it because of that." Yeah. I mean, there's the whole question of the beloved disciple in John, right, in the Gospel of John. I mean, that that he's laying his head on Jesus' chest during the Last Supper. You know, that he's constantly called the beloved disciple. Jesus basically says to his mother when he's on the cross. Here's your son. There's definitely something close there. Different. Um, so that would be an example. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have two questions, but I'll go with the one that I'm most passionate about. Um, David and Bathsheba. Um, mm -hmm. I hesitate to call that an affair. My, uh, I see it more as a rape. Okay. Because, I mean, she's alone, her husband has gone off to war, and David should have been at war. He's one of the few men mm -hmm. in town because springtime is... He sends, so he sees her bathing, mm -hmm. which was very normal to be bathing, and uh, he's the one who's spying. She's not putting herself on display, um, even though later artists show that. Yeah. Um, but he's, you know, so the scene is, she's at home, with probably her woman folk and maybe some slaves and servants. And he sends his men. So like a troop of David's soldiers come mm -hmm. to her house and say, the king wants to see you. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't see her as having much of a choice. Mm -hmm. It's also in very interesting in the context of his relationship with Jonathan that there would then be this very aggressive, um, really hostile kind of relationship with a woman. and. Um, and then she takes over. She says, you know, uh, we're going to dedicate our first son. After he kills, well, arranges for her husband to be killed. Um, in, at, you know, in no, the, it's a sordid story. It's very sure. sordid. <laughs> I, I, I want to advocate for her <coughs> to, to not use the term affair. Fair enough. And um, call it an assault or a rape. OK. Yeah. I, can, I can agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Two questions. Are there any examples in the Apocrypha um, that you might know of? And also, are there any examples of two-spirit or mm -hmm. trans people? Um, Not in the Bible that I know of. Um, as far as the Apocrypha, a lot of the art that depicts the book of Judith, um, you know, when Judith is chopping off the head of the enemy, enemy general, Holofernes, her maid is always there beside her, right? And in the book, it's, she's a pretty important sort of supporting character as well. So you could argue um, that Judith and her maid are kind of like this dynamic duo of superheroes, mm -hmm. um, in art at least. And I think in the book as well, it's just played up more in the, in the art. Um, as far as other examples in the Apocrypha, which saints? Oh, saints, there's a ton. <laughs> oh, here you go, trans people, okay, so. What was it, Saint Marina? Yeah, because it's born. This is an Episcopal Church saint, so I thought, oh no, I guess she's probably a Catholic saint too. Is she? I think so. There's a, a, a Marina the monk, right? So she was a woman who um, didn't want to get married, and then her father was going to enter a monastery, and she really wanted to enter the monastery too, and she convinces her father to let her pass as a man, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, lived her whole life, his whole life, as a man in the monastery. And then there was apparently this scandal where somebody, a woman who was around the monastery was pregnant and pointed the finger at Marina as the father, and Marina would not expose herself as a woman himself, whatever, you know, because he wanted to say a monk, right? So it's kind of an amazing um, example. So that's, that's what, fifth century saying, I think? Like but there's that. others like that. There's a lot of that in the early church, um, sort of more gender fluidity, I think. Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc, yeah, that's not in the early church, right? Yeah. What about the um, centurion servant? Um, I've, uh, That's interesting. Because I've heard uh, people uh, just present that the fact, you know, homosexual relationships were uh, visible mm -hmm. in the Roman Empire mm -hmm. and known. They weren't sanctioned like in Augustus's marriage laws. Mm 
but they weren't like outlawed until later. Yeah. And um, yeah, the centurion cares an awful lot about right. And that the, the supposition is that Jesus would have known, or could have basically been at least somewhat aware that this man coming begging for his slave basically to be healed probably was in a very you know a, a close or a love relationship, and he had no problem healing him. Right. So yeah. um, I mean, that's just that's a definite possibility. Yeah. yeah. Lisa, you have a question? Um, yeah, so first, thanks. This was really, really interesting. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about, so this is just kind of an amateur hour understanding, but on my part, I mean, not on yours, um, uh, about, I think, the church's position, or when you reference John Paul II there, in some ways about gender is an idea that the male and female gender have particular characteristics yes, that, yes. Are, um, complimentary. that are complementary to each other and that part of the undergirding of marriage is that, that they bring these complement, kind of a division of labor type idea yeah. among spiritual terms or whatever. Yeah. Um, how does your reading of this or where are they drawing that from mm -hmm. biblically and then how do some of your readings maybe challenge or engage with that understanding of gender? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, I kind of scratched the beginning of the paper a little too much. So so basically, the good thing about John Paul's reading, he, it's all based on Genesis 2 and 3. Like that's the main source. Okay. But for him, it's all about showing this essential complementary of man and woman, and that they need each other, and that you know, man dominating women is not God's will, right? So that's the positive side. The other side, though, is that the whole thing hangs on this idea of complementarity, right? There's no room in there for any kind of same-sex um, pairing. So um, I think it's a case of focusing too much on one particular story, right? Not I mean, it's an important story, granted, right. about it, but I just think that the, the other exa these examples of other relationships show that there can be different ways of understanding um, you know, what it means that the human is not meant to be alone. The other thing on complementarity is um, it's really been used as a weapon, at least I've, I've seen it that way, um, to restrict women and to really like a gag on women. Um, if you look at his, at, uh, John Paul's listing, it's like out of pop psychology 1960s. You know, like uh, really, like, you know, women are empathetic, men are blah, you know. It's, it's, and, you know, you look at the list, you're like, that's a whole human being. You know, I've seen many of these characteristics in myself and in my brothers or, you know, friends, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, you can also look at it from the dimension of controlling women. Sure. So again, in a heteronormative, but, but still like the, phys the uh, person physically woman, mm -hmm. who is very important for the hierarchical church to restrict and really, you know, as much as possible, and then you put them in this box, and when you read his writing on it, it's really biological determinism. Oh, it's really, it's yeah. really a heresy mm -hmm. to say you don't have a potential beyond this list, mm -hmm. and um, it's very, it's very upsetting to read. As you can no, tell. I agree with you. I mean, I guess I just wanted to say that before John Paul, though, the understanding of the story was even worse. Oh, right. Right, because it yeah. was that women were essentially meant to be inferior to men from the start. Right, the original sin had nothing to do with it because she was already like his subordinate because of the way she was created. Right, and so I think John Paul at least reversed that right. reading, which is already present in the New Testament. Right, mm -hmm. you know, women don't talk in church because you know your husband is your head, and you know um, I'm getting it wrong, but basically because he was created after Adam, therefore she was meant to be inferior from the beginning. Right. Um, no, he did do that. He, he improved it a little, yes. but you're right. Yes. It's very limited understanding of. Women as well. What's going on with Jewish scholarship mm -hmm. in terms of these stories? Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good question. Um, some of, well, Ilana Pardes, who I was quoting, is a Jewish scholar, and a lot of the sort of openness to um, affirming these same sex relationships did come about earlier among Jewish scholars, and it's sort of catching on more recently um, with Christian scholars. Certainly the reading of the um, creation of the human as male and female together, and then the subsequent division, is a very old Jewish interpretation. You can find it in the Midrash. So that's, that's a Jewish understanding of the story that I think the Christian church could have benefited from. Um, 
But in terms of scholarship today, I mean, just like Christianity, there's a whole spectrum of Judaism, and there certainly are some very conservative, or I should say, um, traditional rabbis who would not agree with what I'm saying, right? Um, but there's probably a, a lot more, you know, rabbis, at least in New York, who would say, yeah, of course David and Jonathan, you know, like, yeah. So it just depends on the denomination or the, you know, where they stand on that spectrum. Could you, could you explain, your, the first part of your response about how Jewish, the Midrash have seen the Genesis story as separating, like, what, uh, like, what you're referring to, like, is it Genesis 1 where there's just... Yeah, the original one? human, right, is understood to be both genders. Okay. Okay. And then in the Genesis 2 story, what they see as happening is the separation of that original human into two parts, the male and the female okay. part. And that's a very bold interpretation. Other than the woman being derivative. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Which is Genesis, Genesis 1 is where they're as one. spoken of as male and female. And, and, and he made them in his image. Right. You know, which, which by the 6th century has like been wiped out. Like they, they don't have a recollection, like Christianity. Yeah. The patristic, you know, they don't have a recollection <coughs> that it's right there that God made male and female in <coughs> God's image. Right. Well, if, if I remember, I mean, I just read this recently and the 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 creation is it's called they mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so it's in it that's what we're now using for gender non-binary people mm -hmm. um so when i read that i was I, I don't know like punched me in the face i was like yeah. oh my god it's right there yeah. it's the very first the very first sure. thing in the bible mm -hmm. You know. Although it's probably closer to what you said is two spirit, right? That it was both. Yeah, it wasn't both. a non-binary person. It was yes. a, both, a male and female person that yeah. was sent subsequently. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so I've heard you talk about this before, but something that's come up for me now is the focus on these covenants and that the language is clear that there are covenants that um, that are made in the language that elsewhere is very clearly really makes me think as a Christian of like I look ahead and I think of Monday Thursday and I think of our mandate to love one another mm -hmm. as I have loved you. Mm -hmm. I don't remember reading in scripture where our Lord says, and also go back selectively to the Torah uh, when you don't feel like loving one another as I have loved you. But he said, love one another. So I'm thinking of that centurion because that was a huge class. Like in that case, mm -hmm. the love of the centurion was what our Lord used to heal. The faith and the love is what allowed that healing to take place. Yeah. So I'm seeing different models of mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. um, not saying Adam and Eve, I don't see love there, but mm -hmm. I see these great models of love and I feel like, wow, isn't that what we're called uh, to witness. So this is what I think about yeah. rather than the clobber phrases, which are really super important. But I don't know if you sort of focus on yeah. the gospel. Yeah. In other words, the, there are a couple of verses in the Bible that, you know, unmistakably condemn homosexual sex, especially between men, right? There's, there's no really getting around that. But there are a couple of verses, right? You have a, a really long Bible with lots of stories to choose from, and you don't have to focus on those two verses. You know, you can you can look more broadly and sort of see the big picture as kind of an argument. So. Yeah. I'm kind of trying to figure out how to phrase this, but we're clearly focused on scripture and in a way the, we would call it the revealed or inspired word, at least from a Christian perspective. Clearly it's all constructed within a certain historical moment by certain people who wrote it, from mm -hmm. men, in certain locations and traditions and cultures, etc. Uh, we were talking about John Paul II and his theology, really. Um, and yet we have human experience as well. How do you, as a scholar, um, really, of, of scripture, its multiple cultural dynamics, um, engage the Bible on the one hand, theology on the other, social, anthropological, human science on the other, mm -hmm. social movements currently taking place. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we've gone deep into like analysis of, of scripture. Um, 
how do you personally, socially, as a professor, kind of locate that with the broad framework, um, especially for students that you're educating? Um, what does he want? That's a really hard question. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Holy Spirit. No, it's a great question. Yeah, um, we got all night. Yeah. <laughs> There's more wine. <laughs> I think, in terms of just the current issues part of it, that, that part of your question, um, that is so important to meet our students where they are, right? And that if we just sort of talk about scripture as though it has nothing to do with the questions that are troubling them, that are, you know, making them wonder about their allegiance to the church. You know, if we just sort of pretend that stuff's not there, then we would lose them, and they're no longer going to be in the church. And so I feel like it's our responsibility as theology professors to engage those issues, to get hear the student's perspective, right? And whenever I talk about Ruth and Naomi and David and Jonathan, the students are just like, that's in the Bible, you know? And they get really excited and they really, it like opens up a whole little window for them, you know? And so that's why I think it's important to do it because, um, because people just don't know, right? Or they've been told. They've been told the Bible condemns homosexuality, period, you know? Um, and they would never think to look in the Bible for any story that was affirming um, of their identity if they were. So that's why I think it's I'm not gonna, I can't answer the whole question, but that's, that's a start anyway.